will get into lectures. So uh, it's one uh, one forty six right now on the uh, October 29th. So we'll start. Javier, thank you for that. I uh, appreciate somebody acknowledging. Yes, James Neat, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And hopefully I have all the settings still correct. It's always a question. Um, hmm. I think I need to change one thing here. Let's see. I can left. Okay. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> both James has said they're not a fan of pop quizzes. Okay. Um, so I'll let you know uh, a little more insight on on my side. Uh, I'm not a and a testing period. But, uh, as required, we have to have a certain amount of testing. And the pop quiz always uh, is a good idea, indication of, uh, especially online. Um, number one, is the information getting through um, to you, and then is it understandable and retained to some degree? And number two, um, if I'm doing my job. So, uh, a lot of a lot of goes in evaluating after class is done. It's, you know, of course, the grades. Um, uh, grades are, are one thing. Uh, the evaluations that you give um, are another thing. I had a, a couple of different types of evaluations last semester. I had a, um, a, a question I put out to the students last semester, and along with the uh, web advisor evaluation. So all these things I take in consideration, uh, reflecting on my ability, uh, you know, it, and I try to form it and change it prior to the class, any class starting. But then as I'm in the class, then I always am prepared to um, change gears and try to change things at, that may facilitate the class a little bit better. So that's why I asked yesterday if there was anything that's missing that you may need. Uh, a video on maybe some details or something like that. And the question went out yesterday, but it never stops. I mean, it's you can always send me an email or let me know um, if you, you know, if you're having a particular problem with CAD or with something I'm delivering, the way I'm delivering something materials. So I'm trying to make it as accessible for all styles of learning. As we know, there is, you know, the written uh, style, there is the audible. Style and the visual uh, style of learning, and I try to bring all those into my classes. Doesn't matter what class um, it is. And Diana, see you just joined. Let me um, take care of a setting here real quick. I think we can get to it right here. And And one thing, one second here. Okay, Diana. All right, there you go. That should be working for you. The closed caption should be working for you now. All right. Um, so we will continue on this morning with the lecture, and hopefully, um, it wasn't too agonizing on the pop quiz. Let's see, everybody's completed it and got that done. Once everybody has taken that. Um, up quiz, uh, then we'll be able to review that, but I won't review it until everybody's completed that. And we do have some students uh, that listen to the recordings and um, were not able to take the pop quiz. So they'll have to contact me and let me um, unlock it for them specifically with passwords. And James again says he appreciates the variety of learning. All right. Well, I appreciate you appreciating it and let me know too. Uh, and I guess maybe that really leads to some subject matter for some people is, you know, might be stronger in the visual and some subject matter might be stronger. That same subject matter for others might be better in the in the verbal and, you know, this goes a whole, whole wide variety. That's why it's important for you guys to communicate with me. If I'm not coming across clear on a subject or a point in there, just stop me dead in the tracks. Or send me an email. Um, I will address it immediately. I don't want anything to go by, and then it comes up to the final and go, "Oh man, he 
was not very clear on that topic. Um, and, um, you know, then it's a little bit too late when you're in the middle of the final exam, right? Um, James Nick says, uh, my score on the pop quiz is not evaluate your class. It's just proves I am good with pop quizzes. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, yes and no. Um, but that's from your end, James, but from my end, um, uh, it shows something else. Um, the stats, and it, it takes it as a whole, not just you, James, uh, James, it takes it as a whole. As the stats come in or filter through this pop quiz or any test, uh, it, it shows me where my strengths and weaknesses are or maybe the focus has to be. I don't know if you guys realize that the materials that we've covered so far in this class, I mean, you can just go off, and I don't want to call it a rabbit trail, but I would call it a well. You could take any one of these subjects um, that we've covered uh, from day two, I think, or actually day or week, yeah, uh, day two, uh, the first week, and you can just dive deeper and deeper and deeper into them. Um, there's so much for a landscape architect to know, uh, just like there is for any other um, industry. Uh, when you become, I guess, when you become a, a a surgeon, a brain surgeon, yeah, you always are learning. Uh, but hopefully you know quite a bit before you start performing surgeries. Uh, but just like with CAD, I mean, if you're a, you know a, um, expert in CAD, um, all the way through 3D and everything, it, it seems like there's always more to know in CAD. And I don't profess to be an expert um, through 3D and and all that. I know I feel like I know really well the fundamentals um, and can get people. A good foundation uh, before they break into any any 3D software, but um, I'm definitely always learning. And my last class, and I think maybe even this class, there's some conversations I've learned learned stuff on as well, learning some different things that CAD uh, has problems with and how to get around them. So some different issues on that. So Iman says uh, YouTube unit. You know, um, so she's saying that what James Meek says, the score on the pop quiz is not evaluate of your class. It just proves I'm oh, not good with pop quizzes. I thought you said you were good with <laughs> I missed the not. All right. And Iman picked up on that too, not good with pop quizzes. Yeah. So I'll make you, I don't know if this makes you feel any better, but I'm just not good at test taking. What the heck? I don't know why that took off all of a sudden. That was weird. All right, uh, James Meek, no, I never prepared for pop quizzes. Yeah, uh, well, that's why they're pop quizzes to see. It tells me as well, um, how well did I prepare the class? So James McGinn is laughing, all right. All right, let's go ahead and get into this lecture portion um, so we can get through this, so you can get back to your drawings. As I'm going through this, as always, please either post or write down questions that you want to ask later or that you want to email me either on this subject or something that just all of a sudden comes out, from, you know, right field all of a sudden hits you. Um, say, oh, my gosh, I forgot to ask him that question. You can, and don't, don't think I'm going off, off track um, because if it has to do with this class, it has to do with plants. Um, had some conversation yesterday with, with one of students in this class about a particular plant and you know uh, in fact he has happened to have the same plant I have uh, that we have uh, my wife and I have out front and a different a uh, couple different varieties in the back so we have some um, interesting dialogue which I love um, uh, I love that so um, I can't spend a lot of time off topic um, during class because you can see we're, we're all always jammed for time in, in here with the amount of information we have to cover all right, so here, here's a nursery on this slide, this first slide, a, a, a nursery. Um, don't recognize it as any particular chain nursery, but as I mentioned before, uh, some of these independent nurseries are some of the better places, not only to pick out plants, but to gather information. I happen to be looking through a, uh, one of these little throwaway papers that we get, and it advertised the Dallas Ar Arboretum. If you, let me a show of hands, how many, um, I don't know if I asked this before, how many have been there? Dallas Arboretum. James Meek says, all right, one, that's probably because he lives closer to Dallas. Oh, Diana, you, you cannot hear me. Interesting. 
Did I just stop completely or can anybody else hear me? Okay, all right. Um, Diane, I'm not sure you may have to log out and log. No, oh, you can't hear me, so. Um, okay, thanks, Iman. Hold on a second. Let me, um, let me send her a message real quick. Just hold on. Oh, all of a sudden you're not on there. Okay. Or she left the session. All right. Okay, rejoined. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to figure out. All right, uh, right here. Okay, let's see. You know, it looks really weird on the recording and for you guys just to see me standing here staring at a screen, but I am doing something. I'm trying to make Diana. Okay, here we go. Come on. Here we go. Diana, uh, can you hear me now? Hopefully. Can I have you closed caption as presenter? Are you good? No, participant, that might be a problem too. All right, Diana, can you hear me now? All right, I'm not sure if she can or can't. All right. Um, okay, we're going to have to continue on here because I'm not sure you guys can hear me. I'm not sure what's going on on her end. All right. Sorry, Diana. I'm not sure um, what is happening. All right. We'll have to continue on. Um, I think I have all the settings right on my end, so it, at least it looks like it, I do. Um, we'll go from there. All right, so uh, Dav Dallas Arboreum, uh, I think James Meek said he's been there. I'm not sure somebody else uh, popped in and said, get down here. Um, Iman says she, it looks like Iman's been there as well. Um, so if you, if you like, um, uh, James Meek says wedding photos there. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful place, uh, Fort Worth Arboretum, um, for, or Botanical Gardens uh, is nice. Um, they've improved it a lot, um, but um, they had that uh, Rosetta, uh, which is a disease for roses, attacked them. They had to rip out all their roses, so they were rebuilding the rose gardens there. Uh, Fort Worth, the Japanese garden is beautiful. It's nice there. But Dallas Arboretum is it's such a huge area, and they landscape every single part of that. It's just um, incredible. Right now, um, I don't know if they still have them up, but they had pump, pumpkins um, all over the place. These huge displays. Um, our granddaughter and our son and his wife, they went there. I took a couple photos. Uh, just amazing what's going on there and how they maintain this. Yeah, the landscaping is amazing. Um, so amazing they had this one area when we were walking around there we had a, a annual uh, membership uh, one or two years I think it was one year we're walking around this one area and there was a, a fountain much smaller than this one in the center and off to the side uh there was a small little cubby area and they had, i guess it was a waterfall it wasn't a fountain and there were people it was such a tight area that you couldn't get a lot of people in this is pre, pre COVID, and uh so I was waiting for people to get out of there so I could go look at the, you know, the fish and the little waterfall thing and that whole thing. And it's just a small little design area. It probably was maybe 10 by 10 at max, a little walkway going into it. 
And then uh, that little grass area, I'm looking at this grass and I'm like, my gosh, how did they get that grass looking so good, et cetera, et cetera. And then I go over there and it was actually a display of artificial grass. And it looked so real. Um, it was just you know, incredible the way the light hit it and, and everything. So um, it's amazing. So if you get a chance, it's a great place to look at plants. Uh, they have cooking. If you're interested in cooking, they have a full kitchen there. They do uh, cooking demonstrations with what they use out of their organic garden there. I believe it's all organic. Uh, since we've been there, they've opened up an area behind it. I think it was additional um, uh, uh, raised garden beds, I think. Um, but if you get a chance, you like plants, go out there, take a look at uh, Fort Worth is not bad as well. They're coming back and they're doing more. But Dallas is just, just incredible. So a um, lot of good selection there. All right, so as we talk about plant selection, I'm going to use some information here. Um, I'm not going to take time today because of time to click on all these links. Uh, they're not videos, but in the PowerPoints, there are uh, are links through here. I talk about a couple plants just to kind of get an idea what you're looking at as far as description and water and things like that. But if you go to this Texas Superstar, uh, they have a wide variety um, of information there um, all do, dealing with plants but just in different uh, different aspects in that um, within that the Texas superstar again this will be a link here and use this link here to start your research okay so you're gonna have to start researching some of these plants so initially this last week I wanted you to start picking out a few plants it wasn't your total list um, you got a little bit of information down and as we develop into this, we're going to talk more about you know plants um, which include trees shrubs and ground cover um, and grasses all right so th those main areas that i want you to focus on again trees shrubs um uh, i don't think i said plants so like uh, annuals perennials things like that so we got the trees the shrubs the plants ground cover and then grasses and that's what you'll incorporate into your um, front yard design. And then all the information that we're, we are building on, so all the lecture material from, I think it was day one, we, um, I'm sorry, day two, we got into our talking about plants and this whole landscape class. All that information that you're um, getting from me or information that you already have, uh, you know, knowledge you already have, you're gonna be applying to uh, your final project. So all this will build, you're going to apply it into your front yard uh, design um, at a certain uh, certain level. I think you're going to really build on that and apply it into the final project that we will talk about on Monday. We'll do the final project reveal. It's a little typo there. I, have to fix that. I think it's something the way it's presented on here, it kind of whacks things out. Anyway, then you get into the zoning about plants. So you, you're going to have to uh, do a lot of research uh, into this. Um, we, I have this link here for seven steps to a smart yard. And I think I have it broken down here. Um, so it gives you more details. And I may have it in this, in this PowerPoint. I don't remember. But you can always go. Um, I'll have this posted. I don't think it's posted yet. But I'll have this posted. This is a link and just another it's not a video or anything it just gives you some information steps at seven steps of uh, planning a smart yard uh, so they talk about the uh, plan and design so that's what we're kind of working on, on now but before um, as you're doing that you have to it says to reduce reduce the turf area so there's some schools of thought on this uh, they're saying a smart yard so smart yard would mean uh, what they're saying is lower maintenance, and I'll come back to that in a second. What they're saying is uh, less water for the yard, which is a, a definite yes, but there's ways to still have a larger yard with a different type of irrigation to minimize your water costs and be efficient. So that's a little discussion here, but I'm just throwing this out for additional information. Um, so reducing the turf area means the grass area. So the turf is the grass area. So in this left-hand photo here, this photo over here, you can see this turf area is quite 
quite a bit of reduction on that, and they have a larger gravel area or an area for mulch. It looks like they have uh, some uh, zero scape or drought tolerant uh, plants going on on in here. Uh, almost like they have a water meter with a plant growing out of there. I don't know. I'm seeing things. Maybe that plant's back here further. Anyway, um, so that is one way because now you can do a drip system and we'll get into uh, more on irrigation. Um, maybe it is next week or site plan is next week, irrigation. So the following week. And uh, so we can get different types of uh, irrigation systems. And then a small area like this would reduce the amount of uh, water that you have. You're watering a yard and get uh, um, typically five to 10 minutes. Um, you have to kind of gauge it with runoff. Uh, aeration is required uh, for a good, healthy lawn, fertilizing, et cetera. So the maintenance goes up with a, what they're saying with a higher turf area. And they're saying with a larger uh, borders, uh, planting borders, the maintenance goes down. I'm going to debate that just a little bit. Um, it takes to me, unless the borders are properly prepared uh, initially, um, it takes a little more work to watch the weeding and cultivate and adding mulch and to cut the grass and trim it. Um, so there might be a little debate on what is lower maintenance. You know, uh, we, my wife and I are kind of having that discussion in our backyard. We're trying to come up with a design right now to redo the backyard. And um, she's saying, you know, put more borders, planter borders, and so you don't have so much grass to cut. I'm like, grass is easy to cut. Getting down on my hands and knees and pulling weeds and, and remulching and, um, you know, planting additional plants is, is uh, a whole nother. Um, but, Whole other muscle muscle group for an old guy like me. So anyway, it's a little bit of debate, but just uh, think about that. So James Meek says, um, uh, what his wife and his, uh, him and his wife uh, don't like low turf. She thinks it's, it is ugly. So low turf, you're talking about like St. Augustine would be a low turf uh, or reduced. Okay, reduced turf. Um, Kind of lean in that direction, uh, James. Uh, I like I like the look of grass. If you can keep it healthy, uh, keep it constant. Uh, I really do like the uh, lawn look. I like the planter areas to accent the lawn look, not the other way around. So I'm kind of leaning your direction. But everybody's different. Everybody has a different style. So when they hire, when you or anybody hires a landscape designer, uh, architect to come in and do that, you know the architect. The designer, they have to take your thoughts and your likes into consideration. What they like, they cannot necessarily force on you, or they shouldn't force on you or instill on you. They have to take your thoughts um, and develop that uh, around that. Now, there are times when you will meet with a client. Uh, and I've, I had my landscape company, that will happen. And you walk up and say, okay, so you have this beautiful disaster here, what do you want to do? And they go, I don't know, it's up to you. That gives you the the, the total uh, clear palette. Uh, I mean, there's some parameters, of course, there's cost. Uh, you have to look around the style of house and um, um, you might ask them, do you like formal, informal? And they'll go, what's that? And maybe show them some photos of, you know, formal, informal. Uh, so that will give it a little bit of direction, but then it's free game for you to uh, instill what your likes are. Your larger turf area, smaller turf area, uh, a lot of color, low maintenance, zero, you know, just go in your direction. Um, but you'll often get clients to say, no, this is what I envision. And so you have to work towards that. So reduce turf area. Also soil. We have to consider soil. We talked about soil. Um, I didn't mention, I think I mentioned a little bit about soil analysis. Uh, soil analysis can be done relatively inexpensive. You can also uh, get uh, purchase soil analysis kits at uh, local um, hardware stores. Uh, supposedly, they're, they're somewhat good. To really get a good one, you'd want to send it to a horticulture department. I'm not sure if, um, I don't think they do, but they might. PCC North. Northwest campus may have um, 
uh, capabilities of doing that. They have a horticulture department and brand new greenhouse um, as well. And I think it was my last class, there was a student in there uh, that actually his company that he works for set up a set up the new greenhouse that they have there at the Northwest campus, which is pretty, I haven't seen that one yet, but it's a uh, nice facility from what I've heard. So planting, um, now we get into uh, regional, um, regional areas so we're talking about you know different zones we're in regional climates and then we talk about we can introduce another term called micro microclimate so the microclimates uh look let's look at this left photo here or this this left drawing uh you have heat from a wall believe me i know what that's all about um we have a planter wall out front of brick and that grass area just when that sun hits and cooks that planter wall up that grass just really struggles about three feet out, two and a half feet out, really struggles. So, you know, we have to get more water to that area because of the bouncing off of that. Uh, wind direction, um, sunlight. Uh, so these are the micro climates that you have to consider. Once you zero in, um, once you zero in on the regional climate, uh, then you have to start looking at the microclimate in the different parts of the yard, different elevations, and you get into water and drainage and um, just a whole bunch of parameters in that that come in and tie into the actual planting. This is not just picking out the plants, but yeah, I've picked them out. So are they going to do well in the microclimate that I'm going to put them in? So it's another consideration. Mulching we talked about uh, this this week as well. Uh, the um, the uh, weed cloth that you can put down, whether it's good or not, the different types of weed cloths to use, different types of mulches, the colored ones, the natural ones, um, organic ones, another consideration. We'll get into, in a couple of weeks, we'll get into irrigation. Uh, here is a, 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 a nice photo of a, um, a very expensive drip system. This is, uh, looks like it's a, a maybe a metal, um, of some kind um, along this type of uh, irrigation system. But we'll get into irrigation systems and how to lay those out um, and what the different applications, the lawn area for, for planter area for uh, a micro climate and that it's also affected by irrigation. So maintenance, um, I found this, I thought this was a cool, cool photo. I found, I found one, um, that a guy had a sculpture, I don't know what it was, an elephant or something, um, that he was actually working on doing maintenance, but it didn't really lend itself uh, to this class too well. I thought that would have been cool, but anyway, um, Jay's McGinn says that's pretty pretty awesome. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to know how the uh, engineering on that is done. I mean, I, I know how they did the, the softscape on this, but the hardscape as far as the the water fountain. I like to see how that's all rigged up in the um, in the structure. Um, so maintenance is a huge area. Uh, you know, do you, do you enjoy getting out in the summer heat or the winter cold and maintaining? Of course, in the winter time, there's not as much to maintain. Uh, but uh, think along these lines for a second. If you enjoy getting out in the summer, which I do, um, getting out there and, and just working in the yard and doesn't matter how hot or the humidity. I, you know, I guess spend eight, ten hours out there even with the high humidity. I just enjoy being out there. I bet I love the humidity, uh, but it, the, being outside just overtakes that. Um, James Meek says low maintenance is best for me. Yeah, so it depends on your situation, right? Right, James. I mean, uh, for me, um, I when I, we moved to Texas, I wanted a bigger yard. I thought every Texas house had a big yard. All the land in Texas, I thought everybody had a big yard. Well. Uh, the first house we bought uh, was about I think it was a third of an acre, and we had some landscapes drawn up uh, for the backyard, a very small front yard, and unfortunately I had injured myself. That was one of the uh, issues. But um, basically, when we got into it, it was just all grass area, and so it took a while just you know just to cut that grass area. But if we were going to do any la landscaping, the plans we came up with, uh, which did include a pool that was a dream right uh, but the landscape around that uh, would have been really you know a lot of time involved 
we now live in a postage little small little on a small little lot very small and that's enough for me um like i said in the summertime in the growing time i can spend eight uh eight nine hours out there just taking a small break in between uh of lunch and um you know in the summertime you have a lot more uh, daylight time i'll work till 7 30 8 o'clock um, at night if my wife doesn't call me in for dinner it's like hey what's going on out there and i love it um, but there's enough here on this small lot to keep me busy uh you know i can do saturday and sunday probably eight hours a day uh, during the summer growing months but think about this if i do that think of, and i have my wife's been uh, blessed me so much with specialty equipment and tools I need to maintain all those tools. And that's usually what the winter months are for, you know, uh, getting a lawnmower tuned up, sharp, sharpening everything, which I, I haven't done on a regular basis. I have a ton of tools that need sharpening. Now I'm getting into woodworking, so that's more tools to maintain. But you have to think about not only the maintenance of the lawn, but if you're going to do the maintenance yourself and the tools that go with it, those tools take maintenance too. And I think that's something that people forget. Irrigation systems take maintenance. I got a problematic sprinkler out here i guess i i fixed like probably three or four times and it's not the sprinkler it's the line leading up to it and i have another small pinhole leak in it and i'm gonna have to dig up again and, and figure out what's going on with that now with the winter time great time to do water right uh summer was not bad i don't mind getting wet and soaked and all that but in the winter time uh, it's a bit different story the maintenance on that is really a strong consideration where you're at now as james meek said well maintenance is best for him now um for me um, i'm looking towards retirement and i i look forward to the days where i'm i'm just going to have this place just totally maxed out by the weekend uh, because i worked out it all week and then uh, the following week maybe my wife and i can travel this is you know when we retire i i look forward to doing maintenance uh, James says he's lazy. <laughs> the other James says, I hear you on that. Um, yeah, I'm slowing down a little bit. Talk about laziness. I'm slowing down a little bit too, but I still enjoy getting out there. So maintenance is a huge consideration on this. All right. So I do go back to the verbiage on this. It's the same thing you can pull up on the, uh, the link to the website. Um, so the planning starts, starts in mind considering the family needs. Um, <laughs> ah, that I'm lazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there, there's a lot of comment on that. All right. Um, let's see. So consider the family needs. You know, do you have pets? Uh, do you have kids? Uh, uh, do you have people over a lot? Access, access accessibility. Right now, I'd like the front yard, um, not that we have a lot of people over, but I'd like to put in a, an additional walkway because uh, we have one of those curved um, uh, driveways and the yard, um, you know, if you park on the street, it's just all grass that you, you, know, you would come up to. I'd like to put a walkway in, you know, uh, thinking about parking issues or um, uh, permanent fixtures or restrictions. You have a power pole right in the middle, middle of your your uh, uh, parkway um, or you have irrigation that you know um, that you have to consider in the design um, so a lot of irrigation is, is movable but do you have water lines running in a certain way that you can't move uh, from your water supply uh, what plants do you want to keep um, so you're analyzing a lot now uh, on what you want to keep there. so a lot of considerations going into planning talk about the reduced turf uh, less means more, and this is again where they're saying less, less turf means more time for you to enjoy your yard, your lawn, and more money in your pocket because you always have to use as much water. Well, I already pointed out the uh, pros and cons on that, my thoughts on that. I won't go back into that as well, uh, but I think there's two schools of thought, thought on that. There's, there's certain schools of thought, and it's for certain people, right? uh ground covers we haven't talked much about ground cover uh, we will um, touch on those a little more um, but so ground covers are a great way to have a lower maintenance yard there's a it's called a fig ivy a really small leafed ivy um, that can contain easily with some border material and um, it helps with 
keeping the cost of watering down because it doesn't take a lot of a lot of water. So reduced turf is a big one. Um, yeah, what about collecting? Uh, James McGinn says, what about collecting water, uh, rainwater as a watering source? Absolutely. Um, I have two rain barrels that, uh, that feed from the uh, rain gutters. Um, and these rain barrels, uh, the one, um, I have two different styles. The one uh, fills up so quick. In fact, the small amount of rain we've had over the past week, I think one of them, if not both of them, I haven't had a chance to go out there in the daylight and check. Um, are um, are full just from a small amount of water. Now, in the winter months, if we don't have a freeze, I won't have to empty them. If we have a freeze, I'm going to have to empty them because it will crack. They are plastic um, or a very thick plastic. So rainwater is a great way. I used it all the, all the way in the summer. Um, we didn't have a lot of rain in October, but the other months I had two rain barrels. And uh, to add something on to that, Jane, um, shower or bath water, not water that you bath or shower in, but unless you have a uh, one of these, um, shoot, my mind, water heater, I can't think of the name of it. Oh, God. It. Anyway, it's a, um, uh, a water heater. Mine will come to your comment in a second. A water heater that uh, instantly supplies water heater, um, uh, instantly supplies hot water. Um, gosh, why can't I think of it? Anyway, you can install those and they're really good. If you run the shower water or bath water for a long period of time to warm that up, water up, uh, we collect that in a, in a bucket and we run it, you know, until either the bucket is three, about three quarters full, half full, three quarters full, or the water uh, is turning hot. Um, that will, uh, that water I take out to the rain barrels. Um, if they're low, I'll just dump it into the rain barrels or I'll take that water out in the evening and use that water to water the plants. And usually it will cover most of our hanging plants, which is about four, I think about four of those and some of the smaller plants and maybe one of the larger plants, um, in the summer. So that's from one, that's from one, uh, container of water. So that's another source um, to add into into that as well. Um, Iman, let me let me back up here to Iman's question, um, and I, I don't know if it goes into James McGinn's question about what about collecting rainwater as a watering source. I say absolutely, and then Iman says, city law um, is that legal? Well, <clears throat> as far as I know, in the city uh, 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 city that we're living in, uh, it I've never heard anything against it. Now, what I have heard, and I haven't read this, I'm um, talking about legalities, and this sounds totally wacky, so don't hold me to this, but Colorado is claiming that that state owns the rainwater. I don't know if anybody can comment on that. I haven't read on that. And they're saying that collecting rainwater is, back to Yaman's point, illegal. Oh, no, I'm not, not going to go any further on that. It's absolutely crazy in my mind, but I've heard, well, I was going to say I've heard crazier things, but maybe not. So, Iman, I don't know. You would really have to check into the local uh, restrictions on that. I can't, number one, I can't imagine that happening. Number two, um, in, especially in Texas, you're doing a benefit by collecting your rainwater um, to water your plants. Uh, because you're saving water. As you know, what was it, two, three years ago, we went through the drought situation, I think for a couple of years in a row, that we were only allowed to uh, water once a week or whatever. We're still on a restriction, um, but it's not, not as enforced as it was. So, Iman, you'd have to check into that. James Meek says, in some cities, it is. Okay. Um, all right. I haven't heard about it, James, but that's uh, that's good to know. Some cities won't uh, don't want you to use free water. Yeah, well, um, and that's, I assume you're talking about out here in Texas, which I think is absolutely crazy. Um, he also says, James says there was a big fight about that recently. I think it, oh yeah, in Colorado. Yeah, I, I believe that. I'd be protesting that like 
crazy. I mean, you know, what, what are they going to next claim that the sunshine? Yeah, there you go. This thing goes to state. You can't have solar panels because the sunshine belongs to the state. I don't want to even go there. Hitting on their own soapbox here, James Meek, so keep me off of that. <laughs> right. But if anybody has an additional, additional information on um, that sunlight, let's not even go down that road. I'm sure that's going to be an issue someday. Um, uh, Georgia, lots of life. Georgia limits it for outside use only. So, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So Georgia's saying you can collect the rainwater, but for outside use only. And that's, I mean, I really wouldn't want to use it for anything else. So here's a good point. Um, really wouldn't want to use it for interior, number one, because it's coming off the roof, going through a rain gutter. Uh, the roof doesn't have asbestos, but it has, I mean, there's a lot of um, granular material that comes off a new roof. Uh, we've had a new roof, I think, for four or five years now, and we still get some granular material off of that. So. Yeah, I wouldn't want to use it for eating or drinking, but here's something you just brought to my mind, uh, James. What about I'm using rainwater for in my organic garden? I don't know. Haven't heard any debate or question on that, but that brings a point to mind. So anyway, a lot of discussion on that. If anybody comes up with any uh, hard evidence on either Colorado or any other restrictions in the state of Texas or anywhere else, and the country on rainwater, uh, let me know. It'd be an interesting conversation to have. Um, and he, James says he just did some research. It's restricted in some states, but nowhere is it illegal. Huh. Restricted, but not illegal. So restricted as a sense you can't do it, but not illegal in the this, in this sense they're sending you to prison. All right. Uh, I'll figure that one out later. I got to move on. Thanks, James. All right. Soil, organic matter is the key to solid foundation of your plants. All right. Anything, anybody knows anything about building, constructing, you have to have a solid foundation. I mean, you have to have solid ground, but um, you have to have the right materials or the right chemistry going on in anything that you're constructing, whether a garden, uh, a house, um, a shed. Uh, a gazebo, a pergola, anything you have to have the right foundation. So we're talking about plants here. So again, we need to know what the nutrients are there, what nutrients are in the soil that we're using, what nutrients do we need to add to them as it comes down to. So knowing your soil. Planting, and uh, this gets back into the micro uh, environments, the, mi the micro environments um, that we could run into. Uh, choosing native plants. A lot easier to grow than if we're bringing in some tropical plants um, or from somewhere. Or if the garden department is trouting a certain plant and it looks like the tag says, yeah, it will do in this zone. And it's really a marginal plant. So some research could be done on it to make sure. Um, as I've said before, we don't want plants just to survive. We want them to thrive. We want lawn areas to thrive. We don't. We want this to look good, not just marginal when we're done with this. All this effort, effort going into it. I was reading yesterday an article in one of these um, handyman magazines. They were talking about landscaping, and I was going to post some of the information. I just haven't got around to it. I thought it was really interesting. On um, you know, if you just arbitrarily start planting plants and something you like, and put a couple of them in another they like over here, and you end up with this jungle of I don't want to say mess, but it's not doesn't make any sense. Um, and then they end up either dying or not doing well. You've put all this money into uh, buying these plants and doing some kind of planter bed, and, and where you could have put the money into a good design and do some research onto it. It may have cost you maybe a few dollars uh, out in the uh, in the front, but it might have saved you in the long run um, a lot of money. So. Um, Finding the right plant or the right, right location for the plants that you choose is important. And after you get them in there, make sure you're protecting them. Um, yesterday, I mentioned three to five uh, inches is usually what they recommend for uh, mulch around uh, planter beds. Here it is, it's 10 degrees uh, cooler in the summer. And I think that's one reason our dog sometimes when she's outside, we don't have her outside a lot. 
but she'll be out for a little bit. I mean, she gets too warm, and I mean, think anything over 70 degrees is too warm for her. Uh, she'll go and um, take her front paws and scrape into the planter bed, get down to the soil, and then lay in the soil because it's cooler under the mulch areas. So uh, definitely a good way to protect your investment. All right, watering wise, we're going to be talking about irrigation. You know, my screen just went blank. Get some water while it does that. There it comes back, and I bet you doesn't come back. To, it doesn't come back to any slide at all. And oh boy. Um, James McGinn says I can see you and. Hopefully that's still working. Hopefully you still can hear me too. Um, back to here. Okay, thanks, James. Uh, selection. And we were down here. On. Okay, irrigation. So we'll get into irrigation more, but it's it's so important to have uh, the proper irrigation. Um, excuse me. The proper irrigation uh, really gets into a lot of details. They're coming out with more and more better, uh, more efficient uh, watering procedures and devices. Uh, so hopefully we'll talk about a few of those, including the drip irrigation, which is, um, if you know anything about drip irrigation, usually it was used for the planter beds or has been used for planter beds. But also, they have designed a drip irrigation for lawn areas, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so how often should you water, um, et cetera? Um, that's a consideration again. Larger lawn area, more water, cost goes up. Uh, we haven't increased our lawn area, but our, our watering costs have gone up. Um, and I haven't done enough research to check. I think they're charging more per cubic foot now um, as well. So irrigation is huge. Maintenance we talked about. There again, it depends on you looking at the future. It doesn't just include the uh, uh, plant uh, maintenance or yard maintenance or lawn maintenance um, as far as trimming and cutting and all that, but also we have to look into pest control. If you have a vegetable garden, like right now we have uh, some white fly um, that have infiltrated our uh, tomato plant. Um, so if it wasn't so late in the season, I'd have to take care of those. I try to go to natural remedies first. Um, I use a natural uh, wheat killer, vinegar, and salt and soap uh, that does a pretty darn good job for wheat killing. My wife researched, and there is something for white flies. We didn't get a chance to try it. Too late in the season. Uh, we're, um, as of before the real cold weather, we were still pulling cherry tomatoes off. I think we're up to over, well, my wife estimates about 30 pounds of cherry tomatoes we've pulled off so far. I've mentioned to you before, she's tomato sauce, um, uh, tomato soup. Uh, spaghetti sauce, um, pizza sauce, all kinds of stuff she's made um, from over, I think, I think easily 30 pounds now she estimates we pulled off of there. So the pests, we're just like, okay, have a, have a field day at it. Um, they seem to attack the leaves more than anything. And we think moths are also another problem that they're actually attacking the vegetables, the uh, uh, cherry tomatoes themselves. But back to that, uh, you need, you know, uh, you, are you going to use chemicals? Well, you don't really want to in an organic garden. Uh, maybe you use chemicals. I do use chemicals in different areas. I don't like to, uh, but I haven't found anything yet naturally that works. Um, oh, one of you asked me about this squirrel incident. Oh, my gosh. How much time do I have? Um, yeah, so the squirrel incident yesterday. I don't know if you remember, I was getting all that noise up there. Uh, we determined, I, I determined just not by looking up there, but it was a squirrel because by the sound of it and the fastness that was running around, I thought it got either in a, one of the uh, traps for the rat or a sticky trap. I was dragging it across. I mean, this thing was just going, and I don't know if you guys could hear it during uh, the session or not, but it was loud. 
And so in, on the breaks and stuff, my wife and I were like talking about what to do. Pets, I mean, should we get somebody, you know, to get the squirrel out of there? Um, what, what are we going to do? My wife researched in between. She runs up to Home Depot, gets a squirrel trap. And by the time she got back and one of one of the breaks, um, the trap, uh, the sound stopped. I'm like, okay, maybe, um, um, maybe it's um, dead. You know, I'm thinking. Uh, heavier. Um, let me sidetrack. He was asking about his okay to water at night. Great question. Uh, let me sidetrack to that for a second. There's a lot of theory on that. They say if you water at night, you have a chance of funguses and things like that. Um, so here's my here's my education, my personal experience on it. In California, yes, you probably don't want to water at night because usually the temperatures are, are cooler, uh, doesn't dry out as much. Um, so I would in California, in our area. Uh, what I do, um, here's what I do. I water at 4 in the morning in the summertime, 4 a.m. And sometimes when we're really in the heat, I water at, um, when I go to bed, I'll turn on the sprinklers for about the same amount of time, maybe a little bit shorter than the regular watering cycle. I'll go through a full cycle and water everything, say, at 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night. And then it will come on automatically again at 4 a.m., for the full watering cycle, which will be five uh, five minutes on the shortest, ten minutes on the longest, uh, depending on the area, at 4 a.m. Um, I've never had any problem with um, any kind of uh, uh, anything growing, any kind of algae or anything like that. So that's in the summertime. But here's the weird thing: as we started approaching fall, and it hadn't cooled off that much. I started getting mushrooms, and I had cut back on the watering already because it wasn't necessary. I was only watering two days a week um, on the cycle, and maybe three days. Um, but I started getting mushrooms, and I always thought mushrooms were affiliated with too much water. So um, that was the only thing we ended up with, but that wasn't from the summertime. So I would say, in my experience, Javier, it's okay to water at night. You might push that at nighttime to like really early in the morning, like 3 or 4 a.m. Because uh, we know in Texas it gets so hot so quick in the summer. So I would say it's okay um, within those. And I watered, like I said, at 10, 11 o'clock at night, short cycles. We can talk more about cycles and that, that when we get back to uh, irrigation. So we are, hopefully that helps a little bit. So my wife and I determined that squirrel is either dead or something happened because we could hear it right on the attic, the interior, interior attic pull down that we have. So we put the plan together. Okay, so if that thing is still alive, we're going to take that trap up there. We baited the trap, um, rigged it up. We're, I'm going to I'm going to pull down the attic and then uh, take it up there and set it and hopefully catch it. Right. So the last place I heard it, it sounded like it was right on the attic ladder. I think, well, that doesn't sound good. Maybe it's dead and it's right on the ladder. And I don't want to open that up and have it come falling on me. I really didn't like that idea. So we laid down a towel in the hallway because we always put down a towel because we have hardwood um, floors and the ladder feet we don't want to. <laughs> James again is laughing. Yeah, it, we were laughing afterwards, James. Let me the story it's, it's worse and so we always put down a towel because we don't want the ladder attic heat to, to scrape the floor so we put the towel down anticipation if that squirrel's dead if it has the sticky trap on it's going to fall um, on the towel then i started thinking well what if it's not completely dead or you know the worst case scenario a lot i thought okay i'm going to get a, a tra one of my compost trash cans that doesn't have anything in it and I dried it off and everything. And my wife actually put down a sheet in the whole area. And then we put the trash can right where we thought the squirrel would fall. Okay. So now my wife and I are like freaked out. Like, what is the squirrel going to do? So I start from the backside. I'm not underneath it. From the backside, I'm pulling down on it. So, so I'm, I'm here and the door is opening over here. I'm pulling on the string this way. Now the tail is showing with a sticky trap through the door and as soon as i saw that tail i let i let the, the door go 
And so now I'm thinking I'm going to smash the head of the squirrel in there. So we're watching this thing, and now the sticky trap's starting to slide off of the off the tail um, of the squirrel. Unfortunately, it slid off and hit hit our our wall co our floor covering. That could have been another disaster. That tail is still hanging there, not moving. So I go like, okay, put the trash can. Let's position that. I'm going to open this thing up, and we're going to close all the doors in the house. Open all the exterior. Uh, door so it would if it is alive it and it doesn't it miss the trash can and gets in the house at least it will run out right all right so here we go so now my wife she's not with me anymore she's head she's heading for a chair getting up on the chair which I found out later she got up on the table because she's like freaked out <laughs> James it was funny um so now I open this this up and this squirrel is alive drops down and catches the edge of the trash can and scampers over the edge onto the floor running full bore now it first it misses the front door it goes right by it heads my wife heads to my wife and then my wife's up on the table and screaming at this point the squirrel goes under the table and tries to go up a corner window right by the dog food and it's scampering up these blinds can't get up the blinds. Uh, oh, I, I oh, first it headed over to the laundry room, which was kind of the direction of her. And I'm chase. I'm not ready to chase it now with a trash can lid, trying to herd this thing out. And and then after it went to the laundry room, it went towards my wife and then up the wall. And then it came down, realized it couldn't get out that way, and saw the back door and was able to get out. I mean, talk about a nightmare, a school nightmare in your house. Uh, it was just. <laughs> Iman is like, oh my, yeah. This was like, I'll tell you a cat story one time. It doesn't even come close to this um, another time, but that was a squirrel deal. And so the squirrel got stuck in the sticky trap, was running up in the, in the attic, and making all this noise. Now I got to find out where the heck it came into. I repaired about three months ago, I repaired one area that they, they chewed up and had access to. We've never had any signs of squirrels up there. It's always been a, a mouse or a rat up there. I think we got rid of those. Now we got squirrels. So, all right, I got two minutes to finish this thing up. One slide. So, anyway, thanks for. I just had to tell that to somebody. Uh, I haven't told anybody else. It was just hysterical. Um, now that we look at it, hysterical. My wife tried to take a picture of the tail hanging up, but the picture got all blurred, so I can't even show that to you. So. Uh, what a what a day! And then we had all these people calling. I had this ex neighbor come by that's uh, different, and it was just a, a, a one heck of a day. So anyway, thanks for listening to me on that. So one more slide. So maintenance. Okay, thanks, James McGinn. He says he enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it after it was all over, right? Uh, so maintenance. Um, Got to really consider on maintenance. One last slide here. Uh, so we are finishing up, and it looks like this needs some adjusting too. Nicely. I don't know how that happens. I really try to work on these. So we've talked about in the last weeks, we've talked about site analysis, plant materials, plant and plant material selection. Um, we're going to talk about site amenities, and we're going to talk about site planning, and then we'll get into irrigation. So it's not quite the order, but we will be covering all these. And your final project will start next week, and you will start building off of everything we've discussed. And eventually, when we finish the discussion on everything here, you'll have the information to add to your final project. All right, any questions? I'm, I'm done right on time, as promised, even with the squirrel story. I guess that can't be edited out of the recording. So, anyway. Uh, whoever listens to this tonight will um, probably go, what the heck is this guy talking about? A little bit off topic, uh, but rodents are a real problem with landscaping. There you go. I tied it in nicely. All right. Um, as I close this out, I'm not going to go over to anything else. That's it. Now is lab time. Uh, half an hour. I will be here if you have any problems or questions. And if you have any questions right now, go ahead and post them. I'll leave the recording on for a few seconds. And um, 
uh, during that time, I will be checking email. And then once I get done with email, I'll go to grading the uh, quiz. And I should have that done hopefully uh, for you by tomorrow. And then I won't be able to discuss it until everybody has taken uh, taken the pop quiz. So uh, I'll have to wait till that happens on that. Uh, for those of you listening to the recording, you will have to. Um, okay, Zach's asking for the password. Okay, hold on, Zach. Uh, for those of you listening to the recording, you will have to make arrangements. I have to release the pop quiz, um, and you will also have a password that uh, Zach just is asking for. Um, that I will give it to him in a minute, but I also have to release it, Zach, because it was timed and it's a certain time frame on that. So once everybody has taken the pop quiz, then we will be able to discuss that and then move ahead in the class. And so, Zach, I will get you that password right now. Any other questions, please go ahead and post. And Brian says, um, Brian Dotson says, rotate plan on D sheet for maximum inflow. Rotate plan on D sheet for maximum info. Oh, um, I see what you're saying. And PDF BWG for the three um, assignments. Yeah, it, so all all assignments always have um, PDF and DWG. So let me address that while we got this recording going because this might answer uh, some additional uh, questions that might be out there. Hold on, Zach. So. Uh, Brian, um, first of all, I think what you're asking, can you rotate the um, map, the snip of the map, uh, can you rotate that so you can get maximum um, scale out of that for maximum uh, clarity and viewing um, on that? Okay, yes, you can, but remember to get that north arrow in there because the assumption always is on a on a plan on a drawing that north is to the top of the page unless there's an indication other so yes uh, Brian you can rotate anybody else you can rotate it if it will be scale better you can rotate it but make sure you have a north arrow showing which way is north now Brian to your second point or your second statement um, always read the instructions because it does say PDF and DWG for every uh, CAD drawing now, with what you're working on, um, I forgot how many assignments. I think three of the three of the four uh, assignments were for um, a CAD drawing. Um, two. Um, so the first one's a CAD drawing. The second one's on a D sheet, and the third one is a plant on a D sheet. So. That, uh, Brian, and hopefully this will help answer what you just talked about or give more information to everybody. All three drawings are associated with the same, uh, the same, uh, with the same drawing, but in different phases or different information, the same drawing. So it's the same file, all right? So all the drawings in this situation uh, for your front yard in CAD should be in the same file, the same DWG file. And then you're gonna have, and this is the, on this uh, assignment submission, you're gonna have three CAD drawings. The fourth one is, is just a uh, picture or a scanned in uh, sketch. The three CAD drawings are in one CAD file with only three D sheets. So eight and a half by 11, 11 by 17, delete. And you should have only three D sheets when you PDF it. So hopefully, Brian, I answered your question along with some more information for clarity on that. I'm coming to everybody else in just one second. And I just want to make sure, Brian, I answered that. And if there's any other questions along with that same line, the one file, the three drawings this week on 3D sheets, making one PDF and one DWG. Any comments or Brian, did I? Oh, Brian, I did good. I think you see down there. He said yes. All right. Oh, you said yes to the rotation. Brian, did I answer your question? And then some, I hope. Maybe. All right. Wait till then. I'll look at the other one. Uh, Zachy, I'll come to you. Uh, Derek or PK2, Lab 2, Summit 2, it only asks for, asks for a PDF. 
uh, assignment two. Oh, well, it's a CAD CAD drawing, so um, use the master title block file and D she make PDF. So that doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? Okay, as as stated way back when, any DWG will require PDF. So I'll clarify that. I wasn't sure what to. Um, what I was saying in that was open your master title block for this entire uh, three uh, drawings and um, have three D sheets on there that you would convert to one PDF. <clears throat> That's my interpretation, what I was trying to say there. So, Derek, did I answer your question on that and clarify that? So, anytime you have an associated drawing, uh, meaning that you're working on the same drawing but in different format. You want to only have one file. So that leads me to the final project. And Derek, if you could answer, well, maybe you are answering, I haven't seen a response. Um, if I could, if I, at least the final project, if you are, when you guys start your final project, you're only going to have one, you should only have one file. Even so, it's, I think it's going to be five or six sheets, five or six D sheets. Um, you're going to open master title block. Um, and then you're going to save it as final project. And then you're going to take off the eight and a half by 11, 11 by 17 and the C sheet and make uh, have six D sheets. And that's going to be one file submission, one DWG file and one PDF of the six sheets. I'm going to go back to Derek. Um, are we going to turn in one DWG? Yes. With all AutoCAD assignments. Yes. Always. That's That's been the standard from uh, day two, I think. Um, always a DWG that's coming in will always have will always come in, and it will always associate it with a PDF. Now the PDF will be one PDF, but it may have three or four or five sheets in it. Um, so, uh, yes, Derek, did I answer? Did I do okay on both of the both questions on the uh, packet question and the one you just asked? Okay, perfect. All right, and hopefully that helped everybody else out as well. Let me go down the list here. That is Eric. Uh, James McGinn says DWG file. We need only one PDF with the three drawings in it. One PDF with the three D sheets. You'll do all the drawings in the one file. James McGinn, did I answer your question? Okay, perfect. Moving on, the next one was uh, Derek, I answered yours. And James McGinn says, OK, thank you. Iman says, uh, vegetation CAD blocks downloads as a GIF. How to, how to import AutoCAD as a block? How to import into AutoCAD as a block? I don't know. Uh, a G, I haven't dealt with uh, GIF files. Um, interesting. Um, it's too bad other uh, James isn't on here because I think he used that. Uh, uh, Iman, is that the uh, link that I gave you that I sent out? Okay, uh, look at James McGinn's um, uh, statement there in the chat. He said he downloaded and unzipped the file. So James McGinn, did you not have any problems after you unzipped it? Have you tried any of those blocks in AutoCAD? James McGinn says it was an AutoCAD drawing with the blocks in it. Okay, so back to my statement or question, James. Did you actually put one of those blocks into one of your drawings? Were you able to do that? I'll come to you in a second. Yeah, go ahead and test it real quick while I'm answering you on to other question here. Um, can you can you send it by email? Um, I thought I did. I thought I sent an email with blocks. Did I not? Um,
Uh, you can send the file to me. Well, uh, no need to do that. Are you having problems opening it, James? Okay. Um, you want to send it to me so I can send it to your mom? Is that what you're doing? Okay. What you can do is go to go in like you do an email, uh, contact teachers and students, and then you can go and select Iman uh, email in there and send it directly to her. How about that? Okay. All right. So let Iman let me know that you're having problems with that after you receive James uh, email, and he's experimenting right now. James. Um, the other uh, James says, okay, it's only one download. Okay, all right, in a zip file, I guess, and then it opens as a DWG file. So uh, send that over. Uh, your mom, maybe there was a, a glitch in, in that, in the download or something. So um, uh, James, you let me know if you have any problems using it, in, uh, using the blocks. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So take a, take a look at that. Um, and James is going to test it out. He, uh, James will send Iman the link um, by email. And then Iman, let me know if you have any, any problems with that. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. I think I got everything in the chat box. And Javier, uh, go, let me turn up my speakers a little bit and then go ahead and ask, ask your question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, you, you don't mind my own black because I made three of them by myself so far. Okay, one more time. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't mind if I use my own black. I, I made three of them so far. I made three tree blacks on my own. Is that okay with you? Yeah, yeah. 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 That's fine. That's fine. All right. All right. And another thing I want to mention is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was today this morning. I was I was adding the the gradient on the uh, on the assignment on the assignment on uh, what's the name of it again? Uh, assignment two. And it, for some reason it was lagging. For some reason it was lagging as as I, as I add more gra uh, gra gradient uh, hatching. Okay. It, 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 it's my lag. It kind of messed up. It kind of messed up the color to the point. Where I, the color is no longer there. It, it always lag every time I add more, and then it disappears. Okay, I, I understand. So let me uh, give everybody. And it's a great. That's a great point. As we get more into hatching and and gradients, um, that's a great point. So to help um, your PC, your computer, because um, what's happening is the graphics card and the processor are struggling when you have a lot of uh, hatching going on. So, what you need to do is put everything on a separate layer, um, all the hatching in different layers. So, you might have hatching for sidewalk, hatching for a tree, hatching for grass. Put all that on separate layers. And then, when you're, when you're not working on a specific area with hatching, turn that layer off and then do the hatching you want to do. The more hatching you have on while you're hatching, the it it's harder on the computer. So turn stuff off, put it on layers, and turn it off, and that way it'll make it easier on the computer. And I think it will stop lagging for you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'll be here for about another 15 minutes. Derek, uh, Mr. Taff, I got a job interview last week. Yes, I know you did. Oh, you got the job. Oh, sorry, I misread. Congratulations. Yay. Outstanding. Good job. Excellent. That deserves more than a thumbs up, Derek. Um, do you mind me telling me what company it's with? Topographic, all right, and that's the area you want to go into, right? I, I couldn't quite remember back on that. So we're drafting, excellent, excellent, excellent. Uh, can I ask you another question if it's too personal? You don't have to answer. Is it full time? All right, good deal. And where are they lo located? I think they're right in Fort Worth, aren't they?
Zach says, awesome. Mm -hmm. Eric and Everman. Okay, so are you pretty close? Uh, that's towards the South Campus. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes away. <laughs> excellent, excellent. And uh, so when do you start? Uh, Eleven nine. Okay, so uh, eight to five type thing. Uh, like eight to five. Uh, is it forty hours a week? Eight to five. All right. So you'll be watching these recordings, right? Yvonne says, congratulations, Sarah, good job. So you'll, uh, hopefully the recordings will help you get through this class. I know you'll do fine, um, Eric, and congratulations again on that. Um, you already talked to them. Uh, so are you going to still try to attend live, or are you going to um, uh, just watch the recordings? Live. Oh, okay. You're going to take uh, and break it, break it up. All right. Congratulations, Derek. Good job. Let us know how it goes. And James again says the blocks work just fine. All right. Send them over to your mom, and you guys should be good uh, on that. So I'll be here for a few more minutes. And Zach, um, Zach, was it you that needed the? Password. I'm trying to find it here. Uh, okay, I'll put up the information right now for you, Zach, and then give me a few seconds. Um, I will have to release it to you uh, specifically. So let me put up the information. Uh, who's on first? Okay, let me stop the recording.